Good morning. I hope everyone had a good rest yesterday. After a long lab. Was it good? The lab? Excellent. Up until nine o'clock? The open lab? <laughs> everyone enjoyed it? Cool. Okay. So you spent a lot of time yesterday hearing and exercising um, in the field of the biomarker discovery. SORAP uh, did a great job uh, giving you an overview of what the biomarker is, what it's for, and uh, introduced you into full details of the uh, process of the discovery of biomarkers, the therapeutic targets. So let's suppose that we have identified our biomarker, which is excellent, um, has an excellent profile, and you invest a number of years into the development of that biomarker, and then you spend some $200 million on um, going through all the clinical trials and the ordeal with the FDA approval and everything. And so you put it into the clinical practice, and then it turns out that it's not effective for all patients with this current disease. And even more, um, patients show the full spectrum of the reactions to this particular drug. Side effects, adverse side effects, or lack of the therapeutic effect. And so uh, that's why I think it is really important to take into account all of the aspects of a um, future uh, personalized medicine, which includes both the discovery of uh, novel biomarkers and development of new drugs and the application of those drugs to actual patients. And so in this module, I'm going to uh, focus in the first part on the pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenomics, what it is, uh, and its evolution because it's basically uh, transformed our understanding of clinical intervention from silver bullet to a personalized medicine. And then I will touch a little bit on the whole genome association studies and how those studies um, have proved to be useful for pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetic. And then I will move on to a cancer genomics uh, as a um, uh, special case of a human disease, which is the most uh, complex disease. And then in the second part um, of, of this module, uh, I will be talking about the analytical techniques to analyze clinical data. So you've heard a lot about the whole uh, genome and whole transcriptome data yesterday and the ways of uh, uh, its analysis. And today we're going to talk about the clinical data and specifically uh, about the um, uh, type of clinical data, survival data, and survival analysis, because it's a special type of data and it requires special types of uh, analytical techniques. And these are widely used techniques that I'm going to cover. So uh, the pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomic is the study of the inheritance in variation in drug response. So this drug response can range from life-threatening adverse effects on one end of the spectrum uh, to the equally serious lack of therapeutic effect on the other end of the spectrum. And so over the last half century, uh, pharmacogenetics has actually evolved from a study focused on the monogenic traits, this is pharmacogenetics, to a pharmacogenomics with a whole genome perspective. So uh, the earliest experiments of pharmacogenetics, um, experimentally validated examples, uh, were reported back in 1950s and 1960s. And they grew up from the uh, observations that a large, um, that there is a large differences in response to a standard drug doses in a population of patients. 
So one of the examples was short-acting muscle relaxant, which was given in the standard dose to a number of patients. And in some of them, it caused a serious side effect, potentially lethal, a prolonged muscle paralysis. So the investigation of a process of a metabolism of this drug led to the discovery of a genetic variation within the uh, enzyme metabolizing this drug, which produced dysfunctional form of this protein in those patients. Another example at the same time was reported about the same time was the anti-tuberculosis drug uh, that was uh, showing a bimodal distribution of a plasma concentration in patients and those different uh, dist um, uh, concentrations were related to the risk for adverse effects. And thorough investigation of the metabolism of this drug has led to the discovery, again, of a genetic variation in the activity of an enzyme NAT2, which was responsible for catalysis of this drug. So these observations served as a stimulus for additional studies in this area. But again, the focus of the pharmacogenetics was um, a particular uh, factor and in most cases in pharmacokinetics, and that is a drug metabolism. And it would be usually a typical phenotype to genotype approach, which is widely used in human genetics. But the following examples actually illustrate the evolution of pharmacogenetics from a biochemical to a molecular pharmacogenetics. So these are sort of the icons of that era, the CYP2D6 story. So this gene is a cytochrome B450 family of microsomal drug metabolizing enzymes. This gene catalyzes by a transformation of a wide spectrum of drugs, antidepressants, antiarrhythmic drugs, and it also activates analgesic prodrug codeine. So, and then the thorough investigation of this gene in a population of patients um, showed that actually those patients had a great number of, a great frequency of uh, genetic variants within this gene. Some of the patients had non-synonymous coding SNPs associated with the decreased activity of this protein. Some of the patients had gene deletion. Other patients had gene duplications, up to 13 copies. And so um, this plot, this figure, actually shows you a fre the, dist the frequency distribution of a ratio of a drug to its metabolite within a population of patients. And you see here a few groups here. So the major group is um, was called an extensive metabolizers. But there were two extreme groups that were called poor metabolizers and ultra-rapid metabolizers. And so now you can imagine that the poor metabolizers can suffer from the excessive drug effect when given something like an antidepressant, for example. But in case of the codeine, they may lack therapeutic effect because this protein is supposed to metabolize codeine into morphine. And conversely, the ultra-rapid metabolizers may suffer from the excessive um, effect of, say, antidepressant, but, um, I'm sorry, lack, lack of the uh, therapeutic effect of the antidepressant but at the same time, they can be overdosed with codeine because they metabolize codeine into morphine too rapidly. And so there, there were cases of a respiratory arrest in those patients, which were given in standard doses of a cough depressant containing codeine. So uh, another example is the TPMT story. Uh, this protein catalyzes the S methylation of thiopurine drugs. 
and thiopurine drugs are cytotoxic and immunosuppressive drugs. Um, they are used to treat the acute lymphoblastic leukemia of childhood and some other diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease and organ transplant recipients. So this, these drugs, unfortunately, have very narrow therapeutic index, meaning that the difference in concentration of a drug necessary to achieve a therapeutic effect and the concentration of a drug that caused toxicity is very small. So the most serious toxicity, which is induced by the thiopurine drugs, is life-threatening myelosuppression, bone marrow suppression. Then it turned out that there is a genetic polymorphism inactivating TPMT through protein misfolding. And that genetic polymorphism was um, associated with the increased risk for myelosuppression. And so those patients who had that mutation were um, had to be given one tenth to one fifteenth of a standard dose. And so this example actually was the first example of including pharmacogenetic data into the drug label. And this is very important because you can imagine that, for instance, you put the new drug into the clinical practice. And as I mentioned before, it turns out that it has very serious adverse effects in a large fraction of a population. And it may be ineffective. And um, you cannot really predict uh, what dose you are supposed to give to a patient. And then, in the end of the day, gone through the ordeal of uh, development and testing this drug and putting it into the clinic, you have to withdraw it. So this is a very painful process, and it was really a breakthrough that FDA started hearings on this topic, and this was the first example. So this figure just shows you the distribution, frequency distribution of TPMT activity level in red blood cells and um, they designated the inactivated um, um, isoform with low activity and the wild type is high activity. And so these patients were homozygous with a low activity allele, these, these ones were heterozygous, and these ones were homozygous for a wild type allele. So pharmacogenetics has been focusing on a monogenic Mendelian trait and mostly on the pharmacokinetics aspect of a, um, of a drug. But it's becoming increasingly evident that most of the human diseases are a polygenic traits and the drug responses to a proper therapy is also governed by many factors. So the brutal fact actually uh, was that even if you know the factor that is playing some role in the uh, diverse reaction to the drug, even if you know it, it does not explain 100% of cases of variability in drug response. And so with the following example, I'm going to show you that not only pharmacokinetic factors, but, not, but also pharmacodynamic factors actually influence uh, the efficacy of drug and um, the side effects of the uh, therapy. So the EGFR story here. So um, endothelial growth factor receptor is overexpressed in non-small cell lung cancer. And there was a number of antibodies developed against this receptor. One of them was gefitinib. And it was also noted that um, there was a wide range of response to this antibody. And best responders were women, never smoked, and of East Asian origin. 
So then when they started to probe different populations, it turned out um, that there was a genetic variation in the target of this antibody, EGFR, in the ATP binding site. And this mutation actually was activating. So patients with this mutation responded better. And so within this a North American population, there was very low frequency of this mutation and very high frequency in East Asian population. And again, very high frequency in responders versus very low frequency in non-responders. So that's how there was a, um, discovered a direct link between this, uh, this mutation in the drug target, which is a dynamic factor. So here's another story, the warfarin story, which is um, probably uh, the ultimate example here. So the warfarin is the most widely prescribed oral anticoagulant. And unfortunately, it has serious adverse effects, hemorrhagin and desired coagulation. So this drug is predominantly metabolized by a cytochrome P450 family member CYP2C9. It's another one compared to the first one, but still. So it was found that there were two common polymorphisms present in, within this gene, and they were associated with a decreased activity of this protein. One of them decreased activity down to 12% of the wild type, and another one down to 5% of the wild type. So the frequency of polymorphisms was about this level, about 10%. Unfortunately, the pharmacokinetic genetic variation this one, did not explain most of the variance in response in patients given warfarin. And for quite a long time, the target of this drug was not known until some 2004 when this gene was identified and cloned. This is V4C1. And also, no non-synonymous uh, SNPs were found within this gene. Uh, several haplotypes were discovered within this gene that were associated with the final dose of a warfarin. So warfarin's story actually represents, uh, probably in a simplified manner, a polygenic model that we must expect to see in the future. So this model includes both the pharmacokinetics fa factors which um, alter the metabolism and the final concentration of a drug, and pharmacodynamic factors, which affect the drug target and the pathways downstream of that target. So the um, Yesterday, you've heard a lot about the different uh, approaches for uh, detection of new biomarkers using different platforms and techniques. But um, in this case, I'm just going to touch a little bit about, uh, on the um, genome-wide association studies. Um, there were uh, numerous publications uh, using this approach, but I'm just going to give you an example how these type of studies can be used directly in clinic. So what is the genome-wide association study, just to remind you? It is an examination of genetic variation across a given genome designed to identify genetic associations with observable traits. This type of analysis requires two groups of participants, subjects with the disease cases and subjects without disease controls. So first you do the genotyping of each individual, and then you test the association of set of markers, SNPs, with the disease or trait. So this is just a um, 
list of some of the recent publications where the GWAS has been used for the detection of um, some polymorphisms that could contribute to risk of a number of diseases, including diabetes 2, breast cancer, and others. But unfortunately, the problem with the GWAS studies is that the odds ratio is pretty low. But there is one example, and this is a statins story. So the statins are a class of drugs that are used for um, uh, controlling a cholesterol level. So they are an HMG, coenzyme A reductase inhibitors. So the serious side effect of these drugs is myopathy. And so there was a clinical trial, search, called search, commenced to investigate the effect of the drug dose onto the patient's response. And as a part of it trial, the researchers investigated patients who had a serious myopathy. So they had a number of 85 patients with this condition versus 90 control. And the genotyping gave the GWAS study gave one single polymorphism in this transporter gene which had an incredibly high odds ratio. And this is a p-value. So for the genome-wide association studies, this is relatively small uh, sample size of patients. But anyway, they proceeded with this funding, finding, and they validated this finding in a much larger cohort of 10,000 patients. And they got a lower odds ratio, but still, it was 2.6. So the authors stated that they could explain more than 60% of variability in the drug response using this uh, polymorphism. So um, now I would like to change topic a little bit and to talk about the cancer, which is the most devastating and most complex human disease. And here again, I'm going to talk about the cancer genomics, which is the study of the human cancer genome. And it is a search within cancer families and patients for the full collection of genes and mutations, both inherited and sporadic, somatic, that contribute to the development of cancer cells and its progression from a localized cancer to one that grows uncontrolled and metastasizes. So, what is the cancer? Now, I think um, everyone is convinced that cancer is not driven by a single oncogene or tumor suppressor gene. Although there are adepts of, of this theory, but still, it is widely appreciated that cancer is a polygenic disease with many factors involved. And so, this is a typical karyotype <coughs> of a cancer cell. Um, this is a breast cancer cell line, MCF7, and different colors here mean different portions of different chromosomes. This is a sky image. And so you see a great deal of aberrations happening here within the genome. So the aberrations in cancer happen on practically all levels of um, cellular function, starting from the aberrations on the genome level, and these are genomic aberrations, such as inversions, copy number changes, deletions, translocations. Then there are point mutations within important genes. The next level is the changes on the transcription level. And those are differentially expressed genes that we were talking about yesterday in great detail. Then we have changes in splicing regulation. It can be an average splicing due to mutations. It can be um, uh, altered regulation of splicing. 
it's a uh, changes on the epigenetic level and of course it is a change on the protein levels so in addition to a um, wide diversity of events that take place on different levels in cancer there is also another complexity of a reshuffling of the genome within a uh, cancer cell. And so this example shows you how complex the amplicon can be within a particular cancer. This is a breast cancer cell line, and this is a amplicon on chromosome 20Q, and the sequencing of this amplicon gave this structure. So you see a lot of different segments coming from different places. Well, in this case, mostly from the same chromosome, but also from another chromosome, are concatenated with each other. And this finding was validated using, uh, RD, using PCR on junctions and breakpoints. So cancer also is a very heterogeneous disease. So this is a typical copy number frequency plot. And you see copy number increases and deletions. And so not, um, so these aberrations takes place not in the 100% of um, cases with the same disease. And this is also seen here on the expression uh, profiles, where you often see heterogeneity and some, sometimes you see a subtypes of a particular tumor. And so the HER2 story and trastuzumab story actually tells you um, this is the first story of application of cancer genomics um, into the discovery of a drug and putting it all the way through the clinic. So the ERB2 or HER2 receptor is a cell surface receptor tyrosine kinase and it's member of the ERB family. There are four members within this family. This is one of them. So the overexpression of this receptor results in the activation of intracellular signaling through the ras raf erc and PI3 AKT pathways to promote cell division, cell growth, and inhibit apoptosis. So back in 1987, Dr. Slaman, an oncologist, made a striking observation that a HER2 overexpression was highly correlated with the patient survival and with the tumor size. And so he started to investigate it and he found an overexpression of this HER2 in 25 to 30 percent of breast cancer patients. And the association with the shorter survival and relapse times was significant. So a little later Genentech, in 1990, uh, develops a antibodies against this receptor, and um, it was a breakthrough um, work when they humanized a murine antibody within some 10 months and produced a humanized monoclonal antibody against HER2 receptor. But they were testing this antibody on different uh, spectrum of breast cancer uh, samples. And so they got a only um, effectiveness only in a few percent of patients. And then they were approached with people who knew about the methods developed to detect HER2 amplification with FISH and immunohistochemistry. And once they have coupled this method, uh, these methods of detection of the amplification within breast cancer with the treatment 
with the antibody, they initially, uh, they instantly got a excellent response in those patients who had an amplification of HER2. And so the trastuzumab together with the um, uh, screening test for the HER2 amplification went into clinical trials already in 1992 and now it is a standard of care. The use of tests for HER2 expression status and Herceptin in combination with other drugs. So this slide actually shows you uh, a clinical trials with Herceptin in patients who had a HER2 amplification. So these were a highly selected patient. Um, and so here you see a monotherapy with a Herceptin. And you can see the response rate was um, from about 10 to 30 percent. And then there were a number of trials where they used a combination therapy of Herceptin with these different drugs. And within these two clinical trials, they had a control cohort where they used just this drug without Herceptin. And this is again the response rate. And so you see that the combination therapy with Herceptin in HER2 positive patients gave a response rate of up to 70%. And that was an exceptional breakthrough. But it also actually uh, points out the necessity of uh, approaching a disease from multiple points, from multiple aspects, and using different drugs targeting different targets to achieve a desirable response rate. So this was um, the first example which set the road into this direction. And um, right now there is a great number of um, studies being published um, devoted to um, predicting outcomes of patients based on some set of biomarkers. And yesterday you heard about this paper. I'm just going to remind you a little bit about it um, within a few minutes, where they used a integrative analysis of copy number and expression to predict outcome of breast cancer patients. So the expression signature of breast tumors um, showed a distinct subtypes, including basal, luminal, and RB2. Well, as Sorab mentioned yesterday, it's a little bit of the uh, overstatement here because there is no um, striking uh, clustering of this expression data. This is um, slightly other question. I just have to mention that um, these subclasses of breast cancer uh, had been reported before. But in this case, um, there was, um, and, and also the same pattern, uh, the same subgroups are observed within the model system, such as breast cancer cell lines. And so, but these patients have been treated with uh, aggressive therapy, and that might uh, contribute to a um, uh, clustering like this. But anyway, um, you could see some clusters here, including basils and RB2. So what is the survival experience of these groups? It's uh, shown here. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve, and uh, I'm going to cover this method later. We will be practicing on this particular data set. We will be producing the same Kaplan-Meier curves. So, but what it tells you is that RB2 has the poorest prognosis and the basal subtype 2. And this is based on the expression profiles. This figure shows you a uh, clustering of a copy number changes within the same tumors. And what you can see is that there is a number of high-level amplifiers within a luminal subgroup. 
And when they stratified patients into those who had these high level amplifications and into those who didn't have, they got these survival experiences. So even within a particular expression uh, uh, pattern based subtype, they could further stratify patients into poor and uh, better outcome patients based on the copy number changes. So this is just one of the examples to show uh, what, what sort of um, research is um, taking place right now. So the question here now is, are we really managing cancer? And where are we um, in this fight? So if you look at the statistics, and this comes from the Canadian Cancer Society, of the incidence rate and mortality rate for a few selected cancer types, there is actually a very interesting um, trend. So let's look at the males. These are different cancers. On the left, you have incidence. On the right, you have mortality. So this is lung cancer. It goes down the incidence rate because of the increasing awareness of a, a um, uh, smoke risk factor. Here's the uh, prostate can uh, cancer, which has a peak about 92, 1992, and that was because of the PSA screening test when they entered clinic. And so all of those patients that were underdiagnosed before were all suddenly diagnosed here. And then you see a decline here again because over time it became evident that the test that they were using would not, was not that adequate. And so a lot of patients were actually overdiagnosed at that point. And so that's why it came down. And then it went up again, meaning that they came up with the improved screen that gave this um, incident incidence rate. And so the mortality from lung cancer goes down. This is good. And the mortality um, from prostate cancer, where is it? Yeah. yeah it's not here. But anyway, uh, the mortality from prostate cancer in males is also going down. So this is great. So what do we see in females? It's again very interesting data. So here we have breast cancer and the incidence, um, incidence rate and mortality. So the mortality goes down a little bit because uh, of the um, improving uh, diagnostic procedures. And sometime around 1985, the mammography, the modern mammography went into the uh, clinic uh, increasing the rate of the detection of early stage breast cancers. But interesting thing is that, for instance, the incidence rate of a, um, of a lung cancer actually goes up and mortality goes up. So if you look at all of the cancers together, this is these are males, these are females. This is the overall curve. This is a um, starting point, the baseline, the rate that it used to be at 1980. And so you see that it, there is an increase here in the incidence rate and incidence in the mortality. But if you correct for the uh, aging population, and for the population growth, you see that the incidence goes just a little bit up in males and the mortality rate goes a little bit down. And this is primarily due to the prostate cancer and lung cancer. In females though, you see that the incidence rate is pretty much flat over time and the mortality also stays about the same. 
So this actually illustrates that there is still a keen need in novel prognostic and therapeutic biomarkers. And we need to understand in a greater detail what's happening when a patient is given a particular therapy. And then what particular therapy is um, best for this patient and for that patient. So what have we learned from this part? So the major message is that modern technology and biological knowledge has transformed our perception of clinical intervention. Now it's become clear that there is no one for all um, uh, decision for every, for every patient, but it should be a personalized medicine. And so, um, of course, most of the diseases are polygenic traits, and that increasing, there is an increasing appreciation of genetic and genomic data um, that should be used for drug labels. Modern technologies have enabled scanning of the whole genomes and transcriptomes for additional or better prognostic and therapeutic targets. And then we also could see that the integration of multiple level data, including genomic expression, um, epigenetic, um, histopathological data, increases our power of discovery. And um, but it also clear that still much is to be done for putting principles of personalized medicine into practice. So we need new biomarkers. We need new analytical methodology, and moreover, we need a new legislation for including genetic data into the healthcare. And as for the cancer, still a long way to manage cancer well enough. So now I will take questions. All right. So now for something completely different. Um, <laughs> Once again, so th this this part is really meant to be uh, interactive and and so we're more of a group discussion and so um, I hope that everyone can sort of offer their their perspective and opinions and uh, as I go through some of this material, um, so we are entering a a, a brand new world in t in terms of data generation um, where. Traditionally in bioinformatics, uh, you know, most of the most of the studies up until just a few years ago um, have been focused on model organisms, um, the, the, the the anonymous one human genome project, um, and uh, and and the data. Uh, bioinformatics has really gained strength from from data being put into public repositories as it's being generated, um, and just freely available for research. Um, but we've we've entered a, a, a brand new era where um, if we just do that um, uh, with with human subjects, uh, we have uh, the potential of of uh, introducing um, some some complicating factors in terms of uh, identifying uh, individuals that um, should remain anonymous. So what this is meant to do is just to really promote an awareness that uh, since we're all working with clinical data, uh, some of the care and precautions that need to be taken when handling this data. So uh, we're really going to go over uh, what identifying data uh, means in research. Um, and then we'll go over just the policies of, of, of three example organizations, um, the ICGC, the European Genotyping Archive, and the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. We'll talk a little bit about controlled or tiered access to data. So, really, we've come to um, uh, a situation where we have are generating starts to generate lots of um, uh, lots of data for the purpose of um, studying cancer or studying human diseases. And as I said before, this 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 what this does is it um, introduces a bit of a, a conundrum or a dilemma where we want to make advances in research and, and we've seen many examples that sharing data in the research community um, where international 
collaborators and, and, and actually anyone uh, can download data has tremendous benefits uh, in terms of uh, analyzing data. So the more groups that are looking at the data, the more we're going to be able to extract from that. So we want to be able to promote this. Um, but still maintaining the, the protection uh, of the privacy of the, of the people that actually donated the sample. So, so, so this is really um, uh, an issue that in, in bioinformatics uh, has, has not come up until just the last few years. And uh, so, so we as the data handlers uh, really have to be um, quite careful about this. Um, so, of course, hospitals have had to deal with this and, 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 and physicians have had to deal with this for a long time. But as researchers, uh, now we need to really become aware of this. So, um, genetic data is identifiable. So, what that means is that even with just a very few number of polymorphisms uh, in, on the order of tens, um, you can uniquely identify an individual. Okay? So, so we're, pro, we're, we're generating these data, let's say a million SNPs um, on a chip, uh, but all it takes is, is uh, a few tens of carefully selected polymorphisms um, to then be able to identify that individual. And so uh, why is that a problem? Well, um, we want to preserve the uh, anonymity of the donor uh, in order to avoid certain things like um, just personal embarrassment, um, legal or financial consequences, uh, stigmatization, um, or even discrimination, uh, uh, insurance companies, employment, loans, etc. So um, there's a very nice uh, paper that really kind of outlines this problem, and I recommend that you read it. Uh, it's published in Science in 2007. Um, that uh, really talks about um, the, the sort of coming, um, uh, a, a, the balance point between uh, how research is going to be conducted um, and, and to get the most out of the, the, the data uh, while protecting the privacy of the patient. So, um, so maybe I'll just um, pause there and, and just take any, any questions, comments on, on, on this whole issue and what, what, are, what do people think about this era that we're entering in and, um, and what, what kind of consequences or if you have personal stories or uh, about data that, um, that you want to share. So I'll just open it up for the floor here. Um, what, uh, what people are concerned about or not concerned about, or if you had your data, if you were if you had de donated your samples to research, um, to what extent would you want your um, your privacy uh, maintained? Just open it up. My name is Ling. I'm a clinical graduate at uh, Research and Sorb. Clinicians are more worried about these than the, the actual the patients because we see them hmm. some crazy amazing data to everyone. Right. <laughs> <It's really laughs> and they don't care that much about the, uh -huh. about that anyway. But, uh, no, but not now. But, but they rapidly changed it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Very much so, and and that's uh, that that's really the uh, the setup that one needs to have. Um, uh, so I recently uh, I recently had my laptop stolen, and um, you can imagine how many um, samples, genetic samples, were were actually on my on my laptop. But um, because I'm in the research side of things, uh, actually there was no harm uh, that could be possibly done there um, in terms of revealing uh, personal information about the patients because everything was just through anonymous uh, identifiers and only a few people uh, at the cancer agency um, actually hold the keys to, to DIA and anonymize those identifiers. So I mean I'm sure we all work in institutions where this is safeguarded but um, <clears throat> but it's actually uh, the, the issue is, um, is about when we actually deposit data in um, writing papers and want to deposit data in public repositories um, whether uh, it would take some um, her great heroic efforts, but um, it is possible for people to, to potentially de-identify. De I don't yeah. understand that. Well, how do the do the mapping? You can I can authenticate. I guess that's right to the actual patient, unless you have someone has access to other. Yeah. So you need a matched. With that's with right. Patient, right. So you need a match sample with the linking personal information, and um, so so it's been it's been said also that um, this 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 problem is uh, is might be overstated actually um, that maybe maybe this isn't such a huge problem. But people go ahead with the with the the bank with the databases with with polymorphic for legal purposes and medical legal purposes for criminal purposes. Unless that goes ahead, and then there is a breach on that database that that makes the link. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not going to happen. So, so um, th what this paper discusses is that is the growing body of 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 databases like that, though in the in the in the police system um, and, and other other types of institutions like that, where um, they actually have the samples and the uh, result results of genetic profiling and the personal. End. Information. So, if there's a breach there, it's, it's a big issue. Maybe we should add, you know, like, like, under discrimination or whatever. In, in, in the field of insurance and employment and loans, you can probably do something about it through legislation. Mm. But if you, talk, if you think about what crimes can be committed, yeah. Then, right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Identifiable data and, and privacy law. So, so generally speaking, um, it, identifiable data does fall under um, uh, under the privacy laws of of, of most uh, most countries. Um, and what this results in is uh, is is actually c controlled and, and conditional release of data. Um, and and the, so this data is not available for public release. And and the question is is really does this impact research? So, uh, as I said before, that research has really benefited tremendously, and science has benefited from freely accessible data. Consider the Human Genome Project. So, uh, basically, as the data was being generated, people were able to analyze it um, within literally 24 hours of its data generation. And so, um, labs around the world and, and the scientific community was, was, was trolling through this data um, as it was being generated. And then we have other examples like uh, like GenBank, which is um, uh, you know contains all the sequences um, that have been generated and put in a public repository. This has been uh, in, an actual, absolutely invaluable resource uh, when when trying to you know functionally characterize your sequence or uh, or or what have you. Um, and so uh, so these rich sources of data, uh, we want to probably we want to do something like this for clinical genomics, um, but will this model work? So that's the question. And um, so I think we're still all navigating this space. But, uh, yeah, please. I think that in the clinical genomics thing, is that's where the main problem will come. If you put in a, in a public available database a characterization of the patient by age, gender, whatever disease they have in their, putting all those together, not that much with the SNP, but with all, all those together, someone that knows mm -hmm. the patient, that is a female, that lives in this area, that right. has this disease, it's, more, it's much more, uh, it's going to be a bigger problem than having a, a public accessible database with a bunch of sequence numbers mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. So that's where the thing, that's where, but so for access to that type of data, and I think that's, that has to be protected, that has to be accessible only after some scrutiny of the, the people that have tested. 
Yeah, so um, so one of the things that people do is, for example, they make, um, for example, birth dates less precise. So they just say the year in which someone was born. Uh, and uh, and maybe it's just don't, you know, don't put an address, certainly, in the, in the, uh, in the clinical data, things like that. Um, so it, it, absolutely, so that it t doesn't take, um, even if you don't have precise information, it, it, it doesn't take many variables to be, be able to um, specifically narrow down an individual. So that's a very well, good point. You can write the condition, and from the condition, you can sometimes a bigger story about it. So I just want to go over now how the large-scale data providers are actually dealing with this, with this problem. So uh, the, here's the International Cancer uh, Genome Consortium. Um, they have a white paper here that outlines um, uh, their um, policy. And um, so, uh, again, I, I encourage you to, to visit this because there are some interesting ideas. So, so let's just go over um, the core bioethical elements that are in this document. So it says, for prospective research, ICGC members should convey to potential participants that the ICGC is a co coordinated effort among scientific research product, projects uh, being carried out around the world. Um, participation in the ICGC and its components projects is voluntary. Samples and data collected will be used for cancer research, which may include whole genome sequencing. And the patient's care will not be affected by their decision regarding participation. So uh, basically, the, the patient has to understand that this is a, a donation that's not going to come. In, there's no um, communication back to, to the patient at all. So the samples collected will be in limited quantities, access to them will be tightly controlled, and will depend on the policy and practices of the ICGC member project. At least a small percentage of the samples may be shared with international laboratories for the purpose of performing quality control studies. Um, data derived from the samples collected and data generated by the ICGC members will be made accessible to ICGC members and other international researchers through either an open or a controlled access database under terms and conditions that will maximize participant com uh, confidentiality. So, so I was speaking with Francis last night about this at dinner, and, and so the, uh, the freely available data, um, uh, uh, so, so either through the open data, um, this is going to be pooled data. So, um, so we will have, for example, all, um, all patients with a particular cancer, will, um, the, the SNPs will be um, just pooled together and it will be made as a frequency, uh, a, a, a frequency assessment. So it's a summary of a pool data, whereas the, the individual data will be under controlled access. So those accessing data and samples will be required to affirm that they will not attempt to re-identify participants. Um, and then there's a declaration that there is a remote risk of being identified from data available on the databases. So, uh, and then just to finish off, so once data is placed in open databases, the data cannot be withdrawn later. So once it's there, it's available, then you can't just take it back. Um, in control data ac access uh, databases, the links, the local data that can identify an individual will be destroyed upon withdrawal, and data previously distributed will continue to be used. ICGC members agree not to make claims possible uh, to possible uh, intellectual property derived from primary data, and no profit from eventual commercial products uh, will be returned to subjects donating samples. So uh, so these are the types of um, guidelines and rules that are, are, are governing uh, the ICGC. Uh, are there any comments or questions on, on this? And this, this is literally something that I, uh, I just pulled out from, um, from this white paper. Um, but it's actually of, of, uh, of really quite interesting relevance, I think, to this, to this workshop. Any questions? Yeah, please. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm not sure uh, what implications that has for, for the ICGC. Um, I was hoping Francis was going to be here this morning, but uh, uh, maybe he'll turn up a little later. But so I can give you a perspective from, uh, from BC is that um, so with our uh, ethics review board, um, we had to keep going back like this over and over again. And eventually, um, I think their, their top uh, ethicist said, actually, um, so you, you don't need to actually do that. Um, so so the, the patients, it turns out that our ethics actually consented for kind of um, any kind of experimental analysis. But um, in generally speaking, that uh, I think you're, you're right that most ethics review, board, review boards really require specific um, testing. So I'm not sure how they're going to reconcile that. Okay, so uh, here's the uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, and what their uh, their governance says. So the TCGA pilot project anticipates that, that its data will be of high value in a number of research areas and will be used in many ways. Those include, but are not limited to, the development of new analytical methods, identi identification of the genomic etiology of individual tumor types and subtypes, and development of new experimental, diagnostic, therapeutic, and preventative approaches and strategies for cancer. Thus, the TCGA project recognizes that the data should be available to all users for any purpose, limited only by the need to avoid identifiability of the research participants. And they cite the same paper that I cited earlier. So um, <clears throat> now this one seems much more relaxed uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of it, its governance, and um, 
so, so I think that um, as long so what they're basically saying is that as long as I, uh, I, a de-identification is maintained, then um, then data should be should be made made release, yeah, releasable. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, it's a, the problem with this type of database is also it's a problem of control, meaning if you don't have access anymore to the patient, you don't know what's going to be the future of the patient. And if, if you are assuming this is a healthy control, mm. and you find out that later on that it was not an healthy control, you will lose that information. Yeah. Right? Right. Right. So the the problem of the anonymization of the sample and so doing whatever you want with it will will uh, jeopardize the quality of their control population. Yeah, that's, I think that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Especially with disorders that are not, that are, that's going to appear later on, like cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and calling this, calling this a control population might not be, there, might not be so that if you don't have access to further, to further down clinical information, you'll be not having good quality uh, control. Uh -huh. They were assuming that there would be follow up until death. Mm -hmm. And so you have the all the clinical history of the patient. And so we should be using the full history of the patient. But after the, the, the patient's death, that was the purpose. So you have to get to all the Right, right. Yeah. So. <coughs> okay, so uh, to ensure. Going on with the, the TCJ, so that to ensure protection of genetic privacy for sample donors, data users will have to agree to certain conditions described in TCJ patient protection policy and controlled access policy as to how the data will be used. For example, users will have to agree that they will share these data only with others who also have completed a data access agreement and that they will not uh, patent discoveries in a way that prevents others from using the data. This means that reviewers of a manuscript who, needs to see, who need to see any controlled access TCGA data underlying a result must also agree to these user access conditions before they can see these data. So this is not a, a situation where um, if you uh, have agreed to uh, have access to this data, you can dis distribute it again. So the, on, the only people you can give it to are the people who have also agreed um, to the material transfer controlled access policy. So here is the BC Cancer Institutional Policy. Um, so uh, the, the BC Cancer has supported a collection of de-identified data from more than more than thousand individuals, um, and, and just the the um, so <clears throat> this is just a description of the resource here. Um, and the data collected by the study have been stripped of all personal identifiers, but the wealth of data available on them might make possible the individual identification of some study participants. To protect confidentiality and privacy of these study participants, the recipient who is granted access to these data must adhere to the requirements of this data access agreement. Failure to comply with the data access agreement could result in denial of further access to the study data. Violation of the confidentiality requirements of this agreement is considered a breach of confidentiality and may leave requesting investigators liable to legal action on the part of the study participants, their families, or the Canadian government. So um, this is a, it's part of an agreement that, um, as part of our uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper, um, we, we wanted to release the data so that um, other people could, could pull it down. And this is basically part of an agreement that people have to sign uh, when, they, when they're downloading the data. So uh, what, uh, <clears throat> where we actually posted the data is this place called the European uh, Genome Archive, or Genome Phenome Archive. Um, and this is really created to store and disseminate uh, the data from the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium in the UK, um, which uh, has genotype data on about 17,000 uh, patients. And Anna talked a little bit about some of those studies that have come out from this population. Um, so, so they have a white paper as well that I encourage you to read. And here's their policy. So the EGA will provide the necessary security required to control access and maintain patient confidentiality while providing access to those researchers and clinicians authorized to view the data. In all cases, data access decisions will be made by the appropriate data access granting organization and not the EGA. Um, the data access organization, such as the BC Cancer Agency in our case, will normally be the same organization that approved and monitored the initial study protocol or designate um, of this or approving organization. So, so what the EGA says is, okay, we'll, we'll, control, we'll store the data and we'll disseminate the data um, without, um, <clears throat> without uh, identifying any, any information. 
Um, and all of the consent and, and all of the protection is the responsibility of the organization that provided it in the first place. So it's really quite a, kind of a nice model. And I just wanted to highlight what the process is. Um, so, uh, you know, as we're, uh, we're all involved in some sort of clinical data analysis and um, you come to the point where you want to publish your paper, um, what, what we've done uh, with the EGA, and this is basically the, pol the policy here. So, <clears throat> so what, what we do is we first encrypt, uh, encrypt the data using a, a key um, that's known to, so, so here's what, so let me just um, give you the example from our own perspective. So, so I create a key and I tell the EGA what my key is, I encrypt the data, and then I upload the data to EGA. Um, and then, so it's sitting there in its encrypted form. Actually, so they decrypt it and then, and then encrypt it with, a, with another key. And, and then what happens is um, uh, it's posted there on the website. And you can go to the EGA website and you'll see our little study there. And, um, and so what happens is a user requests uh, data. And when that happens, then the EGA, uh, so they request data to the EGA. So they inform, uh, they inform a committee, which is made up of myself and, and a few other people at the institution, um, uh, that of the request. And the material tra uh, transfer agreement is sent to the user. And then the material transfer agreement is signed by the user or appropriate institutional rep and uh, representative, and then returned back to me, to the committee. And, um, and so then, uh, so this is actually goes to our technology transfer office. And then the, the committee notifies the EGA, and the user is given their decryption key. The user downloads the data and decrypts the data. So it's, it's a bit of a process, but, um, but it's still anyone who wants to have access to the data can do so, just so long as they sign this material transfer agreement. And I think the EGA have provided an incredibly valuable service. Um, I, would not have to, I would not want to be the person that had, had to provide this data myself. Um, and, and so they, they have really set up a beautiful infrastructure for this. And, and I think the ICGC is, is, um, is poised to, to, to have something similar for the, for the cancer genome projects that are, that are coming out. Um, but if you are at, at a stage where you're writing up your paper and you're, you're publishing um, uh, SNP chips or, or sequence data, you know, I would highly recommend to get in touch with amazing people to work with. And this is like a really seamless pro uh, process that um, I think could have been very, very painful <laughs> uh, in terms of how to provide data, and, and they just made it really easy. So, um, so this is a, this is a, uh, certainly the way to go. So, just in conclusions, then, so uh, potentially genetic data is, uh, is potentially identifiable. Uh, researchers um, certainly have a legal uh, responsibility to safeguard the privacy of donors. So, the way you can do that is simply by working with anon uh, anonymous uh, identified data. Uh, and then several models have now been implemented as to um, how to safeguard the, the patient privacy. And, and one should look at the um, ICGC, the TCGA, and the EGA as, as different types of models to, um, to handle and provide uh, potentially identifying data. So um, are there any comments or questions?